Happy Tuesday morning to you, Carlos. Uh, Happy Tuesday. It's been quite the eventful three days since we last had a discussion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I refrain from heavy liquor and coffee this morning. I'm actually going for tea because I feel like it's the only thing <laughs> that can calm the angst, the existential dread that currently is overflowing in the world, much less my own mind. It's uh it's been a crazy three days. Where does to say the least because we're in a pandemic, but these three days have been kind of bananas. What uh where should we start, man? Uh, I mean, we can cover super quickly Kanye West just going off the rails during a rally. I will say the one quote that really stuck with me is Harriet Tubman oh, never, yeah. re never really freed slaves. She just transported them to different owners. Which... Exactly. She was actually a shill for the uh, Southern <laughs> slavery, pro-slavery movement, according to the musings of one prophet slash Jesus reincarnate Kanye West, also coincidentally yeah. a 2020 presidential candidate. Here's what I'll say about that. I don't take Kanye seriously. No, uh, not at all. Only, the only thing I take seriously is the fact that he is deeply immersed in the Kardashian family. And as we've seen with Lamar Odom and uh, formerly... Whatever that guy's name is. Uh, uh, Scott. Scott. Yeah. Scott uh, Jenner. M Miss, Miss, Miss Jenner. Uh, I mean, dude, if you get involved in that family, there's some shit that is probably coming down the lane right for your face. And I mean, I don't know if you heard, but apparently the Kardashians tried to have him committed. They tried to have him restrained by a doctor in Montana or Minnesota or whatever. Look, man, the only thing I'll give him credit for is he might be actually clinically insane because you can't, evidently, you can't be involved in that family and make it out with your sanity, as we've Unless seen. Unless you're as crazy as them or yeah. on the same page as them. Yeah, it, it was, uh, yeah. I mean, he, he, people have said that he has bipolar disorder and pretty severe at that case. But, I mean, he even went on a Twitter rampage right after the rally, after crying, and just saying that NBC and E! Network won't let – the kids be with him and I feel bad for the guy dude I feel I you know I at first I thought it was hilarious just like I think a lot of people did hilarious in a morbid and sad way but now I'm just I'm concerned for the guy's well-being I'm concerned that there's more to the story that will probably never come out maybe because because here's the thing right either he is truly schizophrenic and has totally dived off the deep end mentally and isn't getting the help that he needs which in and of itself is tragic or there is a kernel of truth to what he's saying which is equally tragic yeah i mean i think there is some truth to what he's saying because uh i guess this morning or late last night or i, I don't really know but kim kardashian had come out and just said i want it, or i'm gonna get a divorce if you don't stop this presidential stuff if you don't stop this twitter rants and exposing our stuff because apparently that abortion stuff with north was true and kim kardashian was furious that he said that out loud yeah i uh he's poor guy i mean he's i don't really know why i don't even know i mean just the situation I, I i won't even try and say poor anything about an individual but man the situation is just tragic it is tragic man you know, like, and, i've seen friends go through manic episodes I've seen friends potentially lose the option to spend time with family because of certain situations in their life and circumstances that are unavoidable or at least in part are difficult to avoid. And no matter what you think about the individual, the overarching situation is just, it's depressing. And I hope whatever it is, you know, whatever the truth truly is, I hope that it comes out and the people who need the resolution find what they're looking for. Yeah. 
I mean, hopefully. And I think I mean, in general, if you know, if you're someone who's experiencing these sorts of manic thoughts or any sort of mental affliction, I implore and hope and encourage you to reach out to anybody, even if it's just someone to listen, because you know we're all in this together. Me- yeah, we're all in this messed up universe and on a more micro level we're all on this planet together and no one's getting out of it alive so the best thing you can do is try to reach out to people that you feel will listen and will not judge and get whatever assistance or aid you might need in order to get yourself on a better track because Mm -hmm. no matter who you are or what you know or where you come from I think we all suffer on a varying degree mental afflictions that can, if left unchecked, be deadly and harmful, not just to you, but to people you care about. So I think that's the the point too, man. It's just the the people that you care about. A lot of times that it gets overlooked when this stuff is going on. But yeah, I completely agree. Just a simple conversation is life changing. Sometimes it can go a long way. Yeah. Yeah, It's, it literally could be life changing because to you, you're just listening, but to that other person, it, it means the world. Even and something as simple as stuff to take. Even as something something as simple as smiling to someone when you pass them on the street when you're walking. And I know that these days with a mask on, it's hard to tell. But, <laughs> but you know, a simple wave or a gesture of acknowledgement, man. You know, I've I've read so many stories about people that were on their way, like specifically with the Golden Gate Bridge, I've read several stories about people that were on their way to consider taking their own life by jumping off and the simple action of being noticed by another human being, whether it's a smile or a good morning or a how are you sort of changes that entire thought process. You know, you realize that maybe you aren't unseen and you are being heard and people recognize you as a human being. And I think it's imperative for us to remember that you don't know on the outside what people are going through internally. And to an extent, we're all battling our own demons. And sometimes all we need to get us to that next day, to that next hour, to that next step forward instead of backward is an acknowledgement of existence. Yeah. Simple smile, man. Can go a long way. Yeah, man. So I hope whoever's whoever's listening that, you know, maybe going through something, just you know, remember that there are people out there that will hear what you have to say and listen to what you're going through. And it's never, it's never too late as long as you're willing to try and reach out. And by that same token, if you're someone who thinks you may know somebody that's going through something, reach out to them. Don't wait for them to reach out to you because oftentimes they don't want to be seen as a burden. And if you don't reach out to ask how someone's doing, you may, you you may regret never taking the opportunity to do so. And it doesn't have to be like, you know, trying to hit the nail on the head right from the beginning. Like, you know, what are you going through or anything like that? A simple just, Hey, how's it going? That's it. I mean, yeah. Sometimes that's the key to just peel the onion and really have them talk. I think the most important thing to take from you know from what you said is just making sure that the lines of communication are open, no matter how trivial it may seem to reach out and say, "Hey, what's up? How are things? How's life? You know, how's work?" or anything that opens that door, even just a crack for someone to feel like there's movement there, is enough in a lot of ways to help people get through it. Yeah. On a more <laughs> or less <laughs> or less sobering or more sobering situation. Um I don't know if you're familiar with the uh nineteen thirty three invention of the uh uh German police. But I don't know I don't know if you know the history behind the SS, but they have a little history of back in the day and the leading up to World War II, they would uh, oftentimes patrol the streets and find dissenters of the Nazi party and the socialist movement, and people would go missing. They would disappear in the back of vans. Un- unmarked vans. Typically unmarked vans. And uh, oftentimes, maybe never heard from them again, or when they were heard from them again, were you know perhaps missing a hand or an ear or whatever other maiming may have bestowed you know, had been, had been bestowed upon them. And here we are Flash forward. In, in America, the greatest country where we fight fascism to the death and people are being literally abducted by the new age version of <laughs> that entity in Portland, Oregon. 
And that's just the beginning because evidently, according to the president's own words, he is deploying federal troops in Chicago and Oakland. Really? Oh yeah. I did not hear that. Oh yeah. It is, uh, it's, it's coming. <laughs> Dude. Uh, let's see. I'll see if I can find it. Jeez. That's <laughs> yeah. Give me, give me your thoughts on that, man. Uh, yeah. I have a friend who lives in Portland and he, regularly post stuff and he was the first one that i heard from about this stuff going on of unmarked vehicles uh military just grabbing protesters off the streets and it it baffles me man every day it seems like something is happening in the u.s and you just gotta say like man this can't be happening and it is and it's being done i mean this news that it's going to happen in chicago and in oakland and that trump is saying it so Non well, for whatever it's worth, right? And I know that people hate MSM, ma the mainstream media. No one likes Fox. No one likes CNN. They're all fake or whatever. But at the end of the day, man, if every single place is giving you the same story, I mean, New York Times, CNN, KQED, San Francisco Chronicle, Chicago Tribune, USA Today, Times of San Diego, I mean, specifically targeting democratic cities. And I understand that, you know, perhaps in some sick, twisted context, those are the cities that are the most problematic. They also happen to be some of the places where the largest cases of coronavirus seem to be spreading. But we all know he's not doing this to keep people safe from coronavirus. No. He's specifically targeting uh, dissenting cities with specifically dissenting mayors that will point their finger at his ineptitude. I mean, it, it, look, you want to know how the, the, so, the Nazi socialist pro-Hitler like, pro entity became powerful was not because overnight they decided to take over Germany. It was because first they started with attacking accredited professionals. First, it was the journalists and the media for bad reporting, bad reporting, bad reporting. Mm -hmm. Then it was the education and medicine departments, you know, and healthcare, where they were talking about how you can't listen to these people, listen to us, we know better, we know better. But for crying out loud, man, at this point, you can't even say it's not a parallel that what's happening here is at least in some ways mirroring, you know, not exactly, not directly, but if you don't see at least some common threads here, then you are, there's no helping you, man. I mean, there's, I, there's so many ties to, I mean, before it was what, the little red triangles that he wanted to, something for the campaign. He wants to basically shut up the news media and call them fake news, which he did from the beginning. There, there's so many comparisons to what happened in either World War II or with Hitler or with anything that it, it's crazy that people, that it's not being talked about more. I mean, what's happening where, in Portland? What I want to know, what I want to know is, where are all these anti-fascist, pro-Second Amendment motherfuckers at? Like, you may not necessarily have to agree with the Black Lives Matter movement, but intrinsically, as an American, you should be standing on the side of protecting people's free speech. Like, that is effectively the cornerstone of the American system. It's the direct check and balance of corrupt proceedings by your government, your tyrannical government against private citizens. And if this isn't a direct middle fucking finger to, to that institution, then what, what are you doing? Oh, all of a sudden now it, it doesn't concern you because it's not the message that you're, that you're trying to convey. I mean, come on, man. Like you want to talk about cancel culture? Look, there are certain, I think, pro- cancellation and pro uncancellation points but real cancellation comes when the federal federal government swoops in and starts abducting citizens for a belief that they hold where does it stop from there that's the thing man it, it doesn't i feel like trump pushes the envelope every day just a little more and a little more and he continues to get to get away with it
every little thing he's done is just a step further, a step further, a step further. And yet somehow his supporters just say, hooray. <laughs> it, it's mind blowing. Yeah. I, at this point, man, Posse Comitatus Act. I thought, I thought it was something like that. Posse Comitatus Act. I think we talked about this a little while ago. So this is like kind of a loose, a loose description of what the Posse Comitatus Act, but basically it grants the government permission to use militia or federal agents to enforce U.S. law and suppress insurrection. I mean, I don't even think that they're looting or rioting in Portland anymore. It's still just peaceful uh, demonstrations. Well, I think in in general, this this is meant more to prevent or to enable the federal government authority to stop potential espionage or terrorism against the United States as, as it stands. But I mean, I'm pretty sure that regardless of this law or this, you know, this act that exists, you can't just go around abducting private citizens, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, it first started with ICE just grabbing people off the street who were immigrants, and now he's moved up to U.S. citizens grabbing them off the at street. At this point, at this point, you have to wonder. This guy almost seems like he is trying everything possible in the dictator's playbook to yeah. get to not get reelected. <laughs> and bro, it, he probably will get reelected. I mean, it's not looking good for my, uh, what we talked about last time, about that third option, Jelaine Maxwell having something on him, especially what happened with that judge, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But he's just, he's pushing the envelope one step further every single time. So originally the Insurrection Act, which I think is the, umbrella with which they're using to commit these abductions, quote unquote. Approval of governors isn't required when the president determines there's a situation in the state that makes it impossible to enforce U.S. laws or when citizens' rights are being threatened. The law would pass in 1807 to allow the president to call out a militia to protect against hostile incursions of the Indians, which has since been extended to military and domestic disturbances and and protect civil rights. Another law in 1878 requires congressional authoritarization for domestic military use, but a legal expert told the BBC the Insurrection Act was sufficient legal authority on its own for the president to deploy the army. So it grants, it grants the president leniency to make this, to make this a judgment call, so to speak, Man, I mean, (laughs) from you know, by by all accounts from video, by all accounts from videos that I've seen, it doesn't seem like there was a direct threat on democracy or on people's rights. From what it seems like from the videos on YouTube, you know, and as many of them as you can watch before you are fully sure whether what you're seeing is true or or not, it certainly seems like there is no. There were no, there was no real foul play going on. It just seems to be a, I don't even know what, man. This, this when, is when, when, when was the law uh, enacted? When was it put in place? It was, it was like in the, the mid 1800s. I think he's just fucking with us, man. I, I think his people find these weird, these laws that went into effect. And I mean, based on his judgment, I'm pretty sure he can spin anything into his judgment and make it right. But I don't know, man. 
this guy is, like I said, just taking it one step further every single time and just seeing what he can get away with. It's the biggest middle finger to the United States I've seen in a while, and he just keeps giving it. Man, it's – this is scary, man. I mean, this is almost certainly how two squash dissenters – I mean, if this isn't – if this isn't mirroring what we've seen in previous dictatorships or authoritarian regimes, then I don't know what to tell you. And that's not even to say that I agree with the violent looting and destruction of property and small businesses during some – and I'll – you know, I'll hedge my bets with the word some of these protests, because in reality, the people that are committing those actions are not protesters, they're anarchists, they're anti-government, they just want to see the world burn. They're not necessarily there for the rebuilding, they're just there for the destruction. So, yeah, I, I mean, this is quite literally tearing at the fabric of what is supposed to make America great. You know, now you have un, unidentified federal personnel in unmarked vehicles just swooping into your downtown area picking up dissenters because they don't agree with the president or because perhaps they attended a a black lives matter matter rally recently so you know i fuck (laughs) yeah that's uh that's a good word to sum up what's going on in portland it's just yeah fuck, uh, well man. and it's not even just portland now man now, yeah. yeah it's moving to oakland and chicago that's i yeah i i, I, can, I can say and i had this conversation with uh someone close to me yesterday but i'm legitimately concerned for november 5th because no matter what happens if biden wins then there's going to be madness. If Trump wins re-election, there's going to be madness. I, I don't see a way in which this situation gets better come November 5th. No, I, not really. Because we're either going to have someone who, in my opinion, is literally losing their marbles, <laughs> or you have Trump who is just, He's the president. Trump, what I mean, what what else? What else can you say? I've gone know. through about I've gone through about two thirds of his niece's book. Oh yeah, yeah. And the entire underlying theme of that book is just the pathology from his father and how that has permeated and exists within every fiber of his being you know a very cold callous narcissistic individual who didn't care truly about his family other than throwing money at things didn't really care about making sure that he was emotionally available to support his kids and that sort of anti-caring attitude and sociopathy is now deeply ingrained in the current president who shows no remorse for actions that are unnecessary or inappropriate, who shows no regard for dissenting opinion, regardless of its merit, has no time for people who disagree with him, has absolutely no actual idea of what the hell he is doing. The only thing he knows how to do is to market himself and to blast his brand all over the place. And he's doing a great job of that because that you know trump is a household name because of donald j trump that's for sure but yeah it's uh it's a pretty interesting read and it's actually a pretty easy read i think it's become at this point more of a uh it's become more of a tribute to her late father mm-hmm. who died when when she was young but uh as far as the family dynamics and how that shaped all of Fred Trump, the patriarch's children, and subsequently the aftermath thereafter. It's pretty, it's pretty deep. It goes into a lot of, uh, a lot of personal childhood traumas that the kids all faced at the hands of Fred Trump and the family. The family dynamic is 
about as fucked emotionally as you could imagine. Kind of like a Kardashian level fucked or? <laughs> I mean, it's, I don't know. I, it's hard. It's hard to say because I haven't read a tell all book about the Kardashian family. <laughs> family. But I think it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility if there was a similar theme that, you know, covers both families in some, in some way. I mean, how do you think uh, Ivanka feels about him? Do you think she's just numb after all the years or? Honestly, I think it's just, they're so conditioned to be the way that they are. You almost have to be treated like a job. Yeah, well, I mean, I think from a young age, you know, they've been handed silver spoons. They've been pretty much given whatever they wanted there. They've always been in the spotlight. It's you have to create a protective veneer around yourself so that you can't be easily torn down. So I think at this point, it's second nature to the whole family. Yeah, they're so used to being that way. They're so used to being emotionally deprived from Don, from from Don, uh, and from Fred, and from all of them. It's, you know, it's hard to develop meaningful connections and relationships when your entire upbringing is devoid of any of it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very seldom that when you grow up in a household that is emotionally vapid and empty, that you somehow grow up to be emotionally connected to other people. You develop, you develop these pathologies that protect you from being hurt And I think at this point, it's just indoctrinated in all of them. It is an ingrained part of their personas. Man, and this family is the most powerful family in the U.S. government at the moment. Yeah. And Uh, I don't know, man. I feel like if someone did a recap of 2016 to 2020, it would just... I don't know. I think we're going to have to do what they did in Germany and just forget what happened because it's well, so bad. <laughs> it's different because in Germany, they don't necessarily forget what happened. Like if you go to Germany, they all the, like for the most part, the concentration camps are still up, but they've turned them into museums so that people who want to get the full scope and uh, of what transpired during that point, that dark point in Germany's history and by extension, the world's history, you can go there and you can experience at least anecdotally and by many, many thousand, thousands, de- thousands of degrees of separation, you can in some ways internalize what really happened there. I've been to Dachau, which I believe is the, was the second largest uh, concentration camp after Auschwitz during, during the Holocaust. And it is a a haunting experience. You know, I'm not necessarily one to believe in spirits or the afterlife or whatever, but when you're there, it's almost like being in a, like, I would say the equivalent would be if you're someone who's very in tune to vibrations by going to a Native American site where, you know, a mass murder or, you know, you you can feel, you you can feel it. You know, it's, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard feeling to describe, but you can absolutely feel the, the negative energy and it it almost, it leaves a lump in your throat and a pit at the bottom of your stomach. It's something that I encourage people who, especially are out there that think (laughs) the Holocaust never happened. Like, first of all, I don't know how you could even think. Right. And, you know, but those are the same people that think Native American genocide was entirely brought on by the Native Americans. So. Yeah, these people aren't aren't willing to be persuaded with uh, with facts. But if you're someone who is curious, I would encourage you to try and muster up the intestinal fortitude to see these places because it is it's unlike anything you can experience in a history book. You know, you can read about it, you can even watch it on a Netflix series. But when you're there, you know, and you read what happened in certain places within the actual concentration camp, it is unlike anything you could possibly imagine. Oh, man, I can, can't even begin to fathom what that's like, man. 
you know, and being there. but one thing that they do is, you know, you're not going to see a statue of Hitler in Munich's town square, but what you can see is a concentration camp that has been turned into a historical monument where you can go and see it. It's not necessarily publicly accessible, you know, like it's sort of guarded off. You have to actually right, right. make the decision to enter, but you, you don't just walk down downtown Germany and see, you know, Hitler's statue hanging around. So this idea that we need to preserve Confederate monuments is ridiculous. We can create museum wings for that sort of stuff. It doesn't need to be put yeah. on a public display. Like it, we're not going to erase history. I still remember who Genghis Khan is. And I don't see statues of him everywhere. Dude, yeah. I mean, I'll still know who Christopher Columbus is in, a, in, in 10 years from now because, you know, history books will have that. I don't need to, I don't need to see him. I don't need to see him in, a, in San Francisco in Christopher Columbus Square. Yeah, that, that idea that taking down monuments is erasing history is silly to me. I mean, you can't erase history no matter how hard you try because of the internet. To be honest, plain and simple, it everything lives on the internet and it lives forever. Yeah. Google search will bring you up everything you want to know about Christopher Columbus, everything you want to know about Hitler and saying that a statue is erasing history is silly to me. That, that argument didn't hold any water and I'm glad the statues came down or they're being taken down for that matter. On a, on another <laughs> important yet very gloomy subject. I'm sure you heard about the uh, the shooting that occurred recently, where a where a child, the son of a judge who was appointed last week to oversee the Epstein Deutsche Bank case, a FedEx driver or Quote someone unquote. who who dressed up as one showed up to her house, executed her son and shot her husband. Now, we don't want to assume anything, but the juxtaposition of that action with what's happening given the, ex the Epstein case, Maxwell recently being taken into custody and all of the connected threads there is, if nothing else, incredibly curious. It it makes me less hopeful for Maxwell. It makes me think that, you know, it's not gonna work out in how people are expecting or hoping. And it just shows that, well, I mean, it doesn't show, we can't assume, but at the same time, I mean, come on. The, 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 the coincidence is too big and too great. I mean, it, it almost seems like this is a Jeffrey Epstein suicide thing again. It, it's, you know, I will, I will say in defense of the possibility that it is coincidence with regard to the timeline, apparently this gentleman and the Atlantic as well as Financial Times have identified th this gentleman as a lawyer, uh, Roy Den Hollander. Here, I'll share the screen with you but yeah so this gentleman apparently has had a previous run-in with this judge uh he and look man i hate i hate conspiracies because they're so you you know how they are man you find a couple of loose ways to connect these things and you suddenly have created you know like like Wayfair, like Wayfair, like Tom Hanks, like all this shit, you know, you, you find these threads, you find a, a weird connection between them and you tout it as fact. And that's another one, man, this whole like Tom Hanks situation, man. There was a, a former, a former actor, I say former because he's recently passed away, but he went on this long rant about how, you know, Steven Spielberg is a pedophile and Tom Hanks eats children and all this stuff and you know what i can't even say anymore that i don't know one way or the other for sure i just you know i, I need concrete evidence man give, give me a picture or some documents if jeffrey epstein has the shit can you just release it so we can all be sure of who's doing what and where but it seems yeah. to be especially in hollywood to be a common trend that there are former child actors you know you have folks that have come out 
like Corey Feldman, yeah, who make these claims and and then you have weird links between Chester Bennington, Chris Cornell, and Podesta because evidently <laughs> Chester Bennington and Podesta look exactly the same, so they must be related. Which, by the same token, means Trump and that old Norwegian woman with her fucking hair back lifting a giant log. They must be the same woman because they look the same. Look, so that, yeah, I've seen that picture. That's a uh, scary, scary how much they look alike. Yeah, evidently with uh, within this situation, it's sad to see, man. It really is, and you could say it's a conspiracy. You could say that it's simple, just the lawyer had a run in with the judge and just kept the grudge. But I mean, it's very, very hard to not say that this is in, in relation to the Epstein case. It's almost, I mean, I'm not gonna say impossible, but it, it, to me, I personally think in my opinion that it's definitely connected. It definitely was a hit. And I it, mean, I think it would you would be remiss in saying anything definitive because no matter what, there is enough tangential evidence to link it one way or the other. And I think to rule out any possibility would be foolish. So is yeah. it absolutely possible that there is some connection? Sure. But given that she was only appointed the case between Deutsche Bank and illegal financing four days ago. Is it really possible that this guy hatched this whole plan in the span of four days and was told that he needed to take care of this problem by someone close to the Epstein Maxwell pedo circle? Poss possibly. But I'm just saying at this point, you can't rule out anything, man. <laughs> this shit just keeps getting crazier by the second. It, yeah. And like, and could this guy even just be a patsy? Could Roy Den Hollander be a patsy? Right? Because how is it that every single time something like this happens, he is an anti-feminist, he is a misogynist, he writes racist shit, and he's pro-Trump. It's all the same themes that you find any anytime something like this pops up, it's automatically. It's the choice of and, words. And, inter and interestingly tied to a particular movement. And that's not to say that th they aren't all connected and they couldn't all be symptoms from the same root problem, but it just seems a little bit too incredible, in my opinion. <laughs> incredible. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, everything that's coming to light, I mean, it's only been three days and it just seems like the, the United States is dirty, dirty laundry is coming in loads <laughs> to be punny about it but we have more and more allegations of either sex trafficking child sex rings sex cults we have hollywood who's under fire we have actors we have this epstein deutsche bank connection we have these assass attempted assassination i mean did they catch the guy the shooter yeah, I mean, this is the guy. They, they, they say they found him dead. Surprise. Every time something like this happens, he's dead. I, well, duh. <laughs> as simply as I can put it, man, it, it always seems, I mean, it does seem to me like he's a patsy now because obviously they pick whoever who has either a questionable past, questionable media presence, and tie him together, and somehow he dies. Did he fail because he didn't kill the judge? Or, I mean, it brings to light so many questions as to why this happened. But I feel like we're left with more string theories that we just try to connect ourselves. I think they give us an incomplete puzzle and just say, here, you make what you will of it, and that's it. That's why this whole thing with Maxwell is just. I don't know. I, I, I think that Honestly, dude, if she, the hope is lost. At this point, I think she needs to accept that she's probably going to get murdered. Oh, yeah. 
Or, I, I, you know, I don't want to say murdered. She, she might commit suicide. She might commit suicide in a very unlikely way. What she needs to do is realize that it's probably inevitable. And I'm not here to say that I know anything. Come on. Like, I'm a guy who has, like, five followers on YouTube. So, like, I definitely don't know shit. But, <laughs> but what she needs to do to make sure that this stuff gets out is she needs to send copies to literally every small newspaper that exists because small newspapers have more vested in reporting accurately because, you know, their, their small communities depend on the reliable information without as much spin as some of the mainstream media, whether it's Fox, CNN, NBC, or whomever perpetuate. Uh, she needs to send it to all of them with the caveat, if I somehow end up dead without a, <laughs> without a fair trial or whatever, then you need to publish all this shit. And she needs to send it everywhere. I'm talking like United States, Canada, South America, Europe, everywhere. Like she needs to send, send copies to literally everywhere because it would be one thing if she sent it to one journalist who then posted it because one person can be discredited as, oh, well, you know, they must have made all this shit up. But if you send it to a hundred, a thousand, 10,000 different places and they all are reporting the exact same story and they all have the exact same information, it'll be almost, it'll be impossible for the small cultish ring that is involved to hide the truth behind what actually was going on. But it, it would be the perfect case scenario for her to do that. I mean, I, I hate how the justice system is. I hate that it's one year later for her to have a trial and that's one, and there's no bail, so she, she's in jail to be, quite honestly, maybe the most dangerous place for her right now. And we, we I, don't, just, I don't think it matters where she is, dude. I mean, if, if Epstein in a high security prison where he's being watched 24 hours a day can somehow manage to kill himself. See, that's uh, why I think that if they know exactly where she is, it makes it completely easier for them. But the thing is, is you don't think that she would be known, like her whereabouts wouldn't be known if she were anywhere? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, she was, well, yeah, I mean, that's true. At th it, I mean, at this point, they already have her in custody, right? So, like, what, what's going to happen if they find some, you know, some covert wing of the federal government to try and hide her somewhere so that people who might have access to her can't get access to her? Like, so someone's going to know where she is, for sure without question. So if someone knows where she is, that's automatically a potential leak, you know, and at this point, whether you're someone who is concerned about what information she has on you, or you're somebody who wants to know how much she actually knows, there are reasons for anybody to want to get to her. Yeah. I, but yeah, I mean, it's, it sucks that one year from now, we have to wait and see and hope really hope that nothing happens there and well, maybe a she has a contingency plan to you know send evidence to small newspapers and with how fractured the current united states is we might not even make it to next year <laughs> we may, we may, that's the other part man after november dude you remember v for vendetta remember remember the 5th of november dude you know that was set for november 5th 2020 right yep it, it, bro, I, I think I, I had tell uh, Kevin about that movie V for Vendetta and he finally saw it and he was like, dude, it's exactly what's going on or sort of happening right now. And I'm like, yeah, man, it's, it's crazy that that movie was made, what, like 15 years ago, 20 years ago, something like that. Pretty old movie. Yeah. I mean, by, and by, by it's so movie. accurate now. Well, you know what I just watched recently too was Idiocracy. So there's another movie that's fucking right on par with what's going on. In the world. I, haven't, I haven't seen that movie in a really long time. But I just bought it. So you and Erica, like you and Erica got to come by for a, for a smoke and idiocracy sesh. But dude, it's what? Yeah. <laughs> Between those two movies, dude, I don't know which one's more accurate. And that's problematic. That's sad. <laughs> if you have a choice oh between V for the better idiocracy. Where's, where's Natalie Portman and Viggo Mortensen when we need him? Or is Man. it Vigo Mortensen? I don't even think it's Vigo Mortensen. I think it's somebody else, but even still. For the guy from uh, The Matrix. He plays, he plays Agent Smith. Yeah, yeah. Dude, it, I don't even think that if 
unless it's like the entire, I mean, I was just talking uh, to Eric about this. Unless we have everybody on the same page, it seems like we won't have change. We won't have anything different because you just have this loud noise coming from both sides and nothing happens. Nothing at all. And we, come November 5th, I mean, I'm not really hoping for anything, really. Fucking, we made jokes before about Giant Meteor 2020, but that just seems like the plan B escape plan. What's coming is not going to be good, either or. No. No, that's something that I had a conversation with uh, some folks about yesterday. And it, yeah. we are currently in the midst of lighting the fuse of several nuclear warheads and we're just pointing them at each other it's pretty uh, much it, it no matter what and we, we can't even go anywhere dude if i want to get away to escape this shit my passport's worth shit luckily i have an Ita luckily i have an italian one so maybe i can sneak into italy and tell them i'm married dude, bring, I have her, a bring her along with me because dude, i can't leave her i can't leave her here for this dude this is fucking insanity dude i have a peruvian passport and i'm like man <laughs> i can't go anywhere either because my wife has a U.S. passport, so... Dude, you need to go to, like, the Peruvian consulate right now and get her fucking... I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll work get her man. ready, dude. Oh, wow, it's still open. Just get her ready, dude. Or go to, you know, go to a, a back alley underground print shop and get some documents <laughs> made so you can get the fuck out, <laughs> it, It's... Yeah, man, it, I don't know what will happen. I just know that it's not going to be good. No, I mean, and when you consider gun sales, we're up like, I can't even like a noticeable uptick in June and July were the amount of gun sales and like 50% of them were to first time gun owners. Yeah. It's, People it's are getting ready stuff. for fucking war, dude. And People are seeing what's coming, man. Or they think they see what's coming. So they're like, fuck it, I'm gonna get strapped to the teeth. And I, if anyone come on, come on my property, I'm going to. Ken and Karen, their ass, like those two lawyers who just got charged. Dude, they got, they got uh, served papers. That's fucking fantastic. Dude, I mean, even if they don't get any jail time, which is unlikely because the Castle Doctrine is an actual thing that, you know, sort of gives them a little bit of leniency to defending their property, even if there's no direct or imminent threat. It's something that a lot of states have adopted. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's hilarious. Yeah. Karen, her mustard stained shirt came out with guns blazing like I'm about to fucking shoot some protesters <laughs> and they were like not today not today we're gonna waste a few days of your life with court documents here you go here's a you've been served and you just have to show up and say not guilty and that's it oh yeah absolutely yeah. nothing's gonna happen let's just hope that Biden picks a great vice president and somehow the dementia comes to light and he's like, I have to step down. Dude, if he picks a, an awesome vice president and then like the, like 8 p.m. on November 4th says, oh, by the way, I'm dropping out of the race, then like his vice president just immediately becomes president. And if it's someone legit that isn't a puppet from either the left or the right, that would be, maybe that would help. But if it's Kanye, we're fucked. Just please don't be Kanye. Don't be any of them. Honestly, the three candidates that we have are Tweedledee, Tweedledum, and Tweedledum ass, dude. Like, I can't. I don't know, man. This election is probably going to be the worst. And that's saying a lot with last one with Hillary and Trump. But when you think it can't get worse, it will get worse. That's the problem, man. Murphy's Law is effectively the overarching theme around america right now you thought it was bad today don't worry tomorrow's worse yeah man i mean we've been doing this podcast and once a week twice a week or even more for you and every day it's just worse more news is coming in of different areas of worryment it it doesn't stop 2020 <laughs> has effectively just shattered hope dude not to like beat a dead horse but like what in this happens every fucking time. Every time something like this happens, the suspect 
mysteriously. Manhattan apartment for evidence, including perhaps a delivery or FedEx uniform used by the shooter at the judge's New Jersey home. The FBI believes Hollander's violent rampage may have started last week in California. There, a 52-year-old men's rights lawyer, Mark Angelucci, was shot and killed, also apparently by a man in a FedEx or delivery uniform. And not knowing that there was an assassin at the door, went and got Mark from his office. He saw the gun turn, tried to run away, and was shot in the back four times. Angelucci had also argued a case involving the question of drafting men only for the military. Dude. I don't even know anymore, man. Shout out to whoever that was, New York, NBC. Yeah. Yeah, man, I don't, Dude. I can't even, yeah. We're at a point in time where I, I feel like more and more news comes to light and I just get number and number to it. It's just like, what's this? The president's accused of this? Well. Fuck, he's been accused before. <laughs> Saw that coming. <laughs> What's this? This guy is losing his mind and he's running for president? Yeah, all right. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you're losing your mental faculties, running for president is the next obvious choice. Yeah, you can either have dementia, you can either be bipolar, or you can either just be a dictator. It doesn't matter. People. You want to know something, and this is something that Tim Pool who I think is a really good, uh, he's the really good independent news source. You know, in, in some ways, I may disagree with his take on things, but I think in general, he tries to really give thoughtful takes on things and uh, really does a good job of going into detail on things. But he brought up a really good point, and I'm going to try and find the part of the clip where, where he talks about it. Hold on one second. Yeah, this is a, a take from Tim Pool's Tim Cast YouTube channel. I suggest you subscribe. I thought I had, oh, you know, I subscribed under a different account. I'll subscribe under this one too. But he does a pretty good job of going into stuff and he tries to remain as centrist and nonpartisan as possible. And, and he'll rake Democrats, Republicans, he'll rake anyone over the coals that he feels like are not giving due diligence to the reporting and potentially exacerbating stories that don't have a ton of merit. Mm -hmm. But this is where I think he's, and where I agree probably almost emphatically with what he is saying with regard to journalism in America. And it's, so he's talking about Michael Hastings, a reporter who died in a very suspect car crash. Uh, one of the folks who was a witness to the car crash said that they witnessed his car going something like 70 miles an hour, maximum speed limit, and the car was on flint was on fl on fire before it crashed. And before this accident happened, day like literally days before, this gentleman was talking to people about this belief that he felt he was being listened to and that someone was tampering with his vehicle only to die in a fiery car crash a couple of days later because he was about to uncover or expose a national story that may take down some, that may have taken down some potentially powerful people. And if it's one thing we know about powerful people is they don't like their secrets exposed. And if you are a dissenter in that way, they will find a way possibly, again, this is just opinion, they will find a way to get to you if they feel like you're getting too close. And I think this is where, you know, he's talking about the death of actual journalism because who in their right mind is going to want to take that mantle? If you know that the possibility of divulging something you know is truthful yet harmful to a lot of powerful people, if you know that you're going to die as a result, what motive do you have other than your own moral compass? What, like what, what it would, propel you to want to put your life and your family's life in danger i don't i don't know if i would be able to do that if i knew that someone was potentially out to harm my family my friends my loved ones would i <laughs> would i take that risk i don't know not but many people would here's his take sounded like a car hack this guy was doing some like deep investigation 
And I'll tell you why journalism is, is, is dead in this, in, in this country and many parts of the world. It's because of stories like the one we're about to tell you. As I said a moment ago, a FedEx delivery driver, that's who walked up to this house and apparently, you know, knocked on the door, rang the doorbell. 20-year-old kid answers it. You see a FedEx guy out the window. What do you do? Answer the door. Bolt to the chest. Bang. That's why journalists are gone. This is a judge, mind you. That's why I want to talk about Michael Hastings. So let's just, let's, let's, not even, let's not even mess around. We got a lot to talk about in this story. Here's the first story from the Financial Times. So I think, I mean, what, what's your take on that, man? I feel like even wanting to voice truth is potentially met with a fatal response. Yeah, man. I mean, we've seen similarities to this throughout time, but I kind of agree with him, man. It, journalism is pretty much dead because as soon as you get a story that is somewhat significant on a larger scale, you're going to get death threats. You're going to get some sort of worryment for your own safety. And we've seen it time and time again, where if the story is big enough, some way or somehow you're going to get targeted and it will affect you. Someone's going to come after you. Yeah. If you're, if you're voicing something, especially if it's true, because here's the thing, they're not going to really go after a conspiracy theorist. Fuck but, no. I mean, why, why do you think Alex Jones is still around? Somehow alive. Yeah. I mean, you get from time you know, through time, I should say, you get these people who have concrete evidence or who have this sort of insider scoop and the powerful people or the powers to be will silence it. They will find a way. They, they, they will either threaten you directly, they will threaten your family. And how can news really be delivered in the United States? It's a scary time, man. You know, I don't know if as a kid, any of us could have foreseen this happening. And perhaps that's just the naive, that, that the naiveness of being young and unaware of what's going on around you. But this is crazy, man. I don't, I don't think it's going to get better. I think it's going to hit, like, we're not even at rock bottom yet. That's the, that's the scariest part. part, man. It's not even rock bottom yet. You know, we haven't, we haven't reached that point yet. And I, can't imagine what's going to happen once that powder keg goes off, man. I know. There's, I mean, I imagine that rock bottom would, for this year, would be November 5th. But there's a lot of time until November 5th hits. And every day it's something new. Every day it's just something surprisingly worse. And there's nothing really we can do about it. That's, the that's, the thing, word, that's the scariest part. It's, I think the best thing we can do is try to stay informed, try to remain as level-headed as possible. As level-headed, yeah, as level-headed and neutral as possible and to take whatever time we have and spend it with people that matter and make, make plans to, to disappear for a bit. <laughs> it seems like <laughs> just to go, yeah, dude, just get out. your uh, zombie apocalypse plan in place. And just, That's just like oh, drive yeah. north into the middle of nowhere, Northern California, right before the Oregon border and just camp out in the woods for a few weeks during November. Dude, just uh, a cabin in the woods. That's all you need and get away from all this bullshit. A cabin, a cabin in the woods. There, there's another movie that is. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good movie. <laughs> I don't know about all that, but it's where you're going to find me. Yeah. And is there anything else that uh that's on your plate that you wanna that you wanna bring up? Uh no, real quick, uh congrats to the Giants winning the Battle of the Bay. Yeah, the what whatever game that was. I don't even know if they <laughs> uh well, you know, there's there's a little bit of solace I can take and make fun of a couple of my Oakland A's friends. So Yeah, something just simple, I guess. <laughs> I'm well, hopeful, man, because the last few years, the Giants have had one of the best records in baseball after like 40 or 60 games. And since the season's only 60 games long, we might make it to the playoffs this year. <laughs> Dude, I mean, it looks good. Let's just, uh, let's just see what happens with sports, man. I mean, I know the NBA is going to restart, and they're, for some reason, 
bitching and crying about staying at a resort. And it blows my mind that these people are like, but we only have one spa to go to. <laughs> it just goes to show that once you get to a certain point of status and money, you just become a whiny little bitch. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I, I like the, there's only one player that really called it out, and that was Steven Adams. And he is just like, shut the fuck up. We're at a resort. That's because Steven Adams is a, is a motherfucking real one, dude. <laughs> he is. That guy, yeah. He is a real one. He's been through some shit, and he comes from humble beginnings. But, I don't know. The Orlando bubble or whatever. Who's, uh, who's winning the NBA title this year? Who? Uh, not the Lakers or the Rockets, that's for sure. Well, I hope not the Lakers. The Rockets for sure ain't winning shit. No. I don't know. I like uh, I like the Bucks. I feel like we're headed for a Bucks Lakers games NBA Finals. It's going to be a Giannis versus LeBron. I think the Bucks could take it, to be honest. But I think so too. But I mean, if if you have a healthy Anthony Davis, which is always the big question mark, and LeBron James, I mean, just the two of them could make a series against the entire Bucks starting five. Yeah, I mean they they added for some reason that dumb fuck J.R. Smith too. Dude, <laughs> that's because J.R. Smith can't count to twenty four. Dude, I hope they give him the ball again. Dude, in one of those clutch situations. Game six, they need a bucket to force game seven. J.R. Smith has the ball. There is ten seconds on the clock. He dribbles up past half court. He stops dribbling. He does a three sixty. The clock expires. They lose. <laughs> I like LeBron's reaction, just pissed, and then remembering that he's on camera and just walks away. He's like, what? All right. Yeah. And it sounds like many uh, beer pong games. <laughs> Who do you think is going to win the NBA title? The Lakers. Damn it. I know. I don't want to say it, but basketball is the one sport more than any other where talent reigns supreme. If you have the more talented – players yeah if your team is more top heavy chances are you're going to win i mean look at look at the team that went to five straight finals recently i mean the warriors probably had three of the top 15 best players in the nba yeah and that's like before you get to draymond green who's arguably top 25 or 30 when he's playing at his best defensive player yeah 100 percent. i mean even as an offensive player just because he's able to move the ball so well you know he sets such great screens it's hard not to you know so I'm excited to see Clay and Curry back healthy. And I don't even think Clay's going to play this year, they were saying. Really? I thought the Kerr said that Clay was healthy. He was shooting around already. And Well, but I think that – so I think the thing is, is they're restarting the season from the point at which they stopped. And at that point, the Warriors were way out of yeah. <laughs> contention. So I don't oh, no, they were the first and only team to not be able to make it to the playoffs. Dude. That's the Bay Area for you. We're either the very top or we're the very or bottom. Very Jeez. bottom, man. We're 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 extre- we're a place of extremes, man. It's uh, either we're... it's either you're wearing a mask everywhere, or, or no one's not. wearing a mask and you're gonna get shut down again. <laughs> I mean, even if he doesn't play, that that kind of sucks. But I get it. I, I I when I heard that they were gonna just either restart it or you know take off where they left off. It sucked because I, well, I was hoping they were going to do what the NHL did and just did a fucking massive tournament. That would have been sick. Especially, that been then, sick. especially because then you know Clay's coming back, for sure. Oh, yeah. And then you know everybody who is an NBA fan would be crying and whining as to how the Warriors got back in. Dude. But, <laughs> dude. <laughs> dude, it could still change. We could still hope. Dude, I know. <laughs> if, that, if that happens, my goodness, I will be watching every single game Oh, yeah. And just laughing at all my Laker and Rocket fan friends. Well, cheers to that, man. And let's hope that somehow cooler heads prevail, logic wins, reason becomes more important than hyperbole and inflation. And we can start to improve the current environment that exists, man, because this is not conducive to progress. No matter what side of the aisle you're on, all this division, all this partisan mockery of our system, all this willing, willing 
willingness to not want to compromise or work together on sub on subjects and problems that affect the majority of us is literally unraveling the republic and if we don't come together as level-headed humans we're fucked we're just another we're just another empire that's crumbling that's all it is i mean here's to hoping that in the next week things get better dude get ice cream have a smile get better cheers brother i'll talk to you later later man